A native of Silver City, Howie Morales got his doctorate in education and taught special education in public schools. He was elected Grant County Clerk in 2004 and was appointed to the state Senate seat of the late Ben Altamirano in 2008. Mr. Morales then successfully ran for re-election. He's a member of the Finance Committee and has focused on education issues. Howie Morales, ex-teacher, sitting senator, now candidate for governor. Let's start with education since you are an ex-teacher. Uh, you've got a pretty ambitious agenda, particularly in the area of preschool, pre-K, early childhood education. You say you want to give that to every child in the state whose parents want it. I think it's a great goal, but it's going to cost a ton of money. How are you going to pay for that? It absolutely uh, is going to be important that we do that within the state. When we look at what research shows us, that's really where it's at in closing the achievement gap. So, I, you know, I think it's an investment that we need to look at within the state. I've always been one that looks at all options and see what are the all options that we can utilize to come up with the funding necessary. We've got to look at it as an investment rather than an, an expenditure. And I believe that that's going to be a key component. Um, myself sitting on the finance committee, I see where we spend a lot of our dollars and where we invest a lot of our, our efforts. I think that we can reprioritize some spending to help out in this area. We're also going to see a real big boost with uh, family members being able to get to work, adding to the income of, the, of New Mexico, where I believe we can create about $110 million extra dollars that would come in and, and assist us in paying for such a bold initiative like this. Well, when you say reorganize priorities, how specifically? I mean, are you, you going to rob something to pay for something? You're going to get new revenue? How's that going to work? I think we need to look at a combination of everything. We need to see where we're spending the dollars. Uh, one example is I would like to move some of the dollars from CYFD and move them more into a focus of early childhood education. I think that CYFD is under protection and enforcement really not in the education side. So there's some dollars that we can move move right there. I also believe as far as generating revenue is going to be key. And that's where we have to look at all options as a possible way to bring in for parents to have the opportunity to have their child receive that quality early childhood education. Well, specifically in regard to education, are you speaking of new taxes? And if so, what kind? I, I think that those would need to be part of the discussion. Now, does that mean that it necessarily is going to be something that we we go with, I think you look at all options, and I think that that would be something that we look at, whether we're looking at, uh, you know, at, at alcohol or we're looking at tobacco sales. It's an investment that we as a state are going to have to look at and come up with the best possible solution. We uh, know that you have the endorsement of the American Federation of Teachers, and I want to ask you about their agenda and your agenda. I assume they match pretty closely but specifically in relation to our horrible high school graduation rate. And we'll, What's the plan? And when we look at that, um, during my time as a special education teacher, I also served as a transition coordinator. So I am proposing that we look at, we don't really lose those students in the 10th and 11th grade level. We really lose them at the middle school. And uh, having a, a real true prevention program for dropouts is going to be key. A transition program is what I proposed to make sure we focus and we find the interest and capture those students before they fall through the cracks when they get to the high school. And we saw it work in the areas where I was an educator at, and I believe it's going to work for the state of New Mexico as well. So you believe that we can bring the rate up pretty quickly, or is it going to take a while? I, I believe we can. We gotta, we've got to realize that we've got to make education uh, as individualized as possible and move away from the standardization of education. So that's going to be one area that I do believe that we'll be able to increase those quickly, but the focus has got to shift from memorization and that rote memory skills to really finding what interests that student, how we can increase their capacity to be a well-rounded student, and having a transitional program gives us the tools to be able to do that. Well, speaking of doing things quickly, let's move to the economy because you say you want to create 200,000 new jobs in the next eight years. Right now, as you know, we are last in job creation since the recession, lowest in the nation, but we're the highest in poverty. Mm -hmm. So creating 200,000 new jobs sounds like quite a challenge. Talk about your plans for doing that. It really is a challenge, and that's the, the bold effort that we're going to make because I Growing up here in, in New Mexico, I get tired of hearing how we're at the bottom of every one of those major categories in the country, 
it's time that we make the shift and we really focus on what areas are we going to build on. There's no reason why New Mexico should be 49th in poverty level. The reality of it is we have many opportunities within our state if we choose to make the investments. When we look at issues like our renewable energy possibilities to put people to work, I think that's where we can align our universities, our, our trade schools, and our high schools to produce the workforce that we're needed. I also believe that there's things that we can build in within the state of New Mexico. We have our tourism that is big and brings in a huge investment. By increasing the budget in that area will give us a return on investment that we're looking for. By tripling our exports, the good things that we provide within our state and getting those out to other countries will also be beneficial. Um, and let's not forget the millions of dollars that we have within our own state government right now that we've appropriated. Those monies have already been accounted for, yet they're not getting out into the local governments. They're not getting out into capital outlay type of projects. Well, in terms of economic development, there's another part of your plan I really wanted to ask you about as well because it all sort of fits together and then it doesn't. You want to raise a minimum wage to $11 an hour within three years, which mm -hmm. is pretty quick. Now, as we know, business will say, we can't do that, it's gonna kill jobs. So on the one hand, we have an $11 minimum wage on the table in your agenda. On the other hand, we have 200,000 new jobs. Mm -hmm. Granted, you're gonna take eight years on that and only three on the minimum, but Talk about how that's going to all mesh together. It absolutely meshes together in a positive way because we're able to put more money into the economy, money that we know that's going to stay within our local, uh, our local cities within the state. And research has shown us that actually businesses benefit when we increase the minimum wage. U ultimately, we want to work to a, a living wage, but I believe that'll take longer. Uh, by 2017, I'm confident we can get to $11 an hour. It's going to be a shift in focus, though. We have our tax structure that's set up that really is set up to benefit industries that are coming in or industries that really may not um, need those tax incentives as much as our small businesses do. Those small businesses were the ones that really weathered the storm during the recession. They've invested in New Mexico and I believe that we need our tax structure that shows that we're investing in them. How would you change that tax structure vis-a-vis -vis economic development and business? I, I would shift the focus as far as the incentives and to prioritize the incentives for those small businesses, those local businesses within our state and provide them with the assistance that's needed when they're providing those employees with the, with the um, wages that they truly deserve. Well, speaking of wages, women, of course, in this state, uh, most of them work. Uh, we just learned that 30% of the working moms with kids under three years old are in low wage work. What would you do specifically about that sector of the workforce? It's 2014. We should make sure, make sure in the discussions that we have that pay equity is part of, of everyday living. And I want to make sure that we have the opportunity and my daughter has the same opportunity to make the same wage um, that my son would make with the same benefits for doing the same job. And I think that we've got to make sure and, and promote that and continue to discuss that. I also feel that um, in discussion with the early childhood education side of it, by allowing and freeing up that parent the opportunity to continue to work or to find other employment while their child is getting educated at the early stages is something that will really benefit our economy and long-term benefit our society. Now, you, you talk about the gender gap, the gender pay gap in your materials, mm -hmm. but, and you say you want to enforce the pay equity law that Susana Martinez signed. How exactly would you do that? Again, I think that as we look and see, first of all, what I would like to do is we need to lead by example and we start with state government. And we do, we go and we do whatever audit is needed, whatever um, information that we need to be provided from the state personnel to see is there a gap and where is that gap and how can we address it. Once we do that, then I believe that we can go on and work with the private sector to make sure that we are being uh, in compliance with the law. Now, on the women's agenda, where do you stand on abortion and reproductive choice? Well, I always believe that it's the constitutional right of the woman to make the choice that she feels is important for her own body and I'll make sure as governor that any piece of legislation that comes up that would threaten that that I would uh, veto any legislation because uh, I believe strongly in that opportunity for the woman to choose. Okay well we're almost out of time but I want to talk just briefly about the race itself. 
You came in first in the pre-primary convention, quite a surprise to some people, probably not to you because you did it. You're a little behind in fundraising. Can you beat Martinez? I'm confident. I wouldn't have gotten into this race if I didn't feel that I could win, that we could change the direction of our state. And the fundraising, you know, what was really interesting is in the last reporting period, I actually out fundraised three of my f of the four opponents. I actually only had a, um, you know, a few days to do that, and I was able to do that. Thank you very much, Howie, Howie Morales. Thank you.